Why is that? How is that possible that when the total market is up, barely, but up, how are you losing so much money? Because if the market over time makes 10% and you're underperforming that by 4, 5, 6%, you are going to have a really, really hard time getting your retirement. In my opinion, most people don't do poorly because they lose money in down years. They do poorly because they do not make money when the market goes up. So I really quick wanted to point out some of the sectors that have done bad, and these are things that you can look for in your portfolio. The total bond market, and by the way, I still recommend that you you should not be in long-term bonds, but the total bond market, it also went up 0.4% as measured by the Vanguard Index Fund uh, Admiral Shares, which means you have at least $10,000. Um, it went up. So large stocks went up, small stocks uh, did not go up, but the total market did go up, and bonds went up. So how do you lose money is the big question that people have asked me. And there's a couple things that I often find are the cause. Uh, one is international. The total international market as measured by the Vanguard, uh, again, their index fund, is down 4.26%. So that could cause a drag, but that should only be a portion of your portfolio. So you shouldn't have a ton of money there. Um, Historically, um, one can argue 20%, 25% should be international. Sometimes I've used numbers higher than that. Thankfully, lately I've been using uh, 5 to 10%. I'm, I'm currently trending up on that in part because it's done so horrible. That's another, another topic for another show. Um, precious metals and mining down 29% last year. That could be a big deal. It's one of those things that a lot of advisors will tell you that you want to diversify, diversify, diversify. And it's true. But you don't want to diversify into shitty assets. Gold, precious metals, they don't make money in the long run. They can make a lot or lose a lot in any short-term period. If you don't actively trade in that, you really what you're going to do is make inflation. I'm not interested in making 3%. I'm looking more at six, seven, eight, maybe 10% or better. So I don't do precious metals. So that's something that has done horribly, horribly badly. Uh, another one is energy uh, with the price of oil going down. The Vanguard index for energy is minus 23%. So if you have international, it could have dragged down your portfolio. But in, in the long run, international does make money. So I'm, not, I'm okay with that. But uh, precious metals, golds. Uh, energy, oil, coal, all those things were devastating in the last year. And if you have a small part of your portfolio in those things, it's annoying. Of course, there's some years that they go up, but again, in the long run, they make inflation, so I'm not very interested. But last year, they might have really, really been bad. So the question is, why do you have those things? And another thing that I do use that is very volatile um, for people that are interested and are willing to take a little more risk is emerging markets. Uh, the emerging markets in the last couple of years also have not done well. And matter of fact, down last year was down about uh, 17, 20%. But there are times where the emerging markets can make 60, 70%. And in the long run, they make something close to stock market returns. Currently, uh, a lot of my clients, that por portion of my portfolio is 3 to 5%. So it's not a real big deal. It doesn't cause a huge drag when it's underperforming like this year but it can provide a little bit of a boost when it does go up 50, 60% in one year. And typically what I'll do then is I'll rebalance it. So if it goes up a whole bunch, we take that off and put it back in the U.S. stock market. Again, it's a small part of your portfolio. And unlike precious metals and uh, oil, it does tend to produce value in the long run. But again, it's not right for everybody. So take a look at your portfolio and see if you made money last year. If you didn't, if you lost 1% or something, you know, it's a bummer, but you know, maybe it's worth fixing or changing. But if you lost 4 or 5 or 6 or 8 or even 10%, you got to give some serious consideration that what you're doing might not be the best thing for you. If I can help you with that, you can contact me via email, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. We also talked a little bit about stock pickers and all those things. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a little break. And we will come back and we will talk to Leanne Lord. She is a well-known, world-famous, I called her, I think, in the interview, comedian. I've been on stage around the country and around the world and on many, many networks and TV shows. So 
It was my pleasure to meet her at multiple conferences and to have her finally on the show. We've been talking about it for a long time. So we're going to come back to her right after the break. Here's an excerpt from Nailed by David Fitzgerald. Didn't there have to have been a Jesus? Perhaps he was just a wandering teacher or an exorcist, an apocalyptic prophet or a zealot who opposed the Romans. Perhaps he was all these things, or even a composite of several such early first century figures. But at any rate, surely there had to be somebody at the original core of Christianity, arguably the most famous individual in human history. All this seems to be a perfectly reasonable, completely natural assumption to make, so why would anyone be so foolish as to propose that Jesus never existed? Doesn't it just make more sense to assume that there was a historical Jesus, even if we're unable to recover the real facts about his life and death? As it turns out, no. The opposite is true. The closer we look at the evidence for Jesus, the less solid evidence we find, and the more we find suspicious silences and curious resemblances to the pagan and Jewish religious ideas and philosophies that preceded Christianity. And once you begin to parse out the origins of this tradition or that teaching from their various sources, the sweater begins unraveling quickly until it becomes very difficult to buy that there ever was, or even could have been, any historical figure at the center. Nailed by David Fitzgerald is now available at atheistaudiobooks.com. Only on Secular Media Network. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are still listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. With me today is the world-famous Leanne Lord. How are you today? I'm fine. Am I world famous? You you are. You know, it is a small world after all. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I, I'll, I, I will that, take that. I learned that from Disney World. <laughs> I guess my goal for this year is to become intergalactically famous, that, that, if that's even possible. Well, I mean, Xenu did it. <laughs> then there's hope for me. Now, for the, the uh, listeners of mine who are unfortunate enough or uh, live in a cave and don't know who you are... Uh, you know, I, I pulled up your Wikipedia page because that's always the best source for information. Oh, my word. I have a Wikipedia page. You didn't know that? <laughs> no. Well, I guess I didn't want to know. It's willful ignorance because you're not allowed to edit your own page anyway. So. Well, well it, you, you tell me if there's anything wrong and maybe one of my listeners could fix it. Oh, my God. Well, okay. As long as we don't do birthdays, then I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has. Uh, you mean your original birthday? Well, my, my birth year, how about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we don't want birthdays either because they could get your credit information or something. Ooh, very good. Uh, like although that. watching <laughs> some of your comedy routines uh, preparing for the show, uh, one of your running uh, uh, jokes is that you don't have money. Uh, right, no, who does? Yeah. Well, yeah. I shouldn't say that. Some people do. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> well, we'll have to work on that. That's, that's I, what, would, I would love to work on that. That's what my show is about, see? I know. Uh, let's see here. We, we've got, uh, you've been on Lifetime, uh, Deaf Comedy Jam, Comedy Central's uh, Premium Blend, mm -hmm. The View, apparently. Yes. Um, and, uh, I, of course, I looked on your website, and you've got these really cool, shiny logos. <laughs> And it's you've got ABC and BBC and Just for Laughs and PBS and CNN. You've been on all these things? Yes, I have. XM Radio? Yep. And I mean, there's so many, I, I can't even say them all. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that, that that's very cool. And you've been doing stand-up for what, two or three years now? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a few minutes. A few minutes. <laughs> I'm trying to remember where I met you first because I... You did uh, American Atheist Convention, right? And, I did, but I, I don't think did. that's where I met you first, was it? No, I don't either. I don't. I don't think that's where we met either. I'm, and I, I, it's actually been bothering me. I was like, I know, I want. I know the conference that I'm thinking of. It's not that. I couldn't possibly have met you at the Irma Malbec Writers Workshop because that doesn't make any sense. No, that that wouldn't be me. That was a different no, Phil Ferguson. Not at all. Not at all. <laughs> well, that's I don't okay. Know. I guess it's just maybe it was just a happy accident. Well, you know, I do run into a lot of people, and last year I went to 14 different events just in the last calendar year for uh, the secular community. Oh, my gosh. That's a lot. Well, you know, just like how, how you going different places is kind of your job. Yeah, that's true. And uh, it's part of my job because I, I meet people, and it's one of those weird things that sometimes I'll meet someone and they, they become a possible client from just that meeting. But then mm -hmm. other times off people go, yeah, I talked to you once four years ago and now I'm changing my job and I want to roll over my 401k. And I always said, whenever that happens, I'll call Phil. So here I am. And I'm like, from a conversation four years ago, 
But wow. You, you never know. So. But that, that says a lot about the impression you made in that conversation that put that bookmark in their mind that firmly that well, see, four years later they still want to call you. Now it would be my turn to be coy. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's one of those things that I get calls from time to time from companies that sell leads. Uh, you know, you, you pay them hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, and they give you a big list of names of people that have been – you know, checked and they actually have money to invest and you can cold call them and see if you can talk them into being clients. Oh, wow. And when those people call me, I usually laugh and I say, no, I'm having a hard enough time keeping up with the people that call me. And they're like, wow, how, how is it you get people to call you? And I said, it's called niche marketing, friend. And he goes, <laughs> oh, sweet. He says, what's your niche? And I go, atheism. And of course, there's that long pause, yes. and they're yes, like, can, "What?" Can silence. <laughs> yeah, I said, "Ain't no other financial advisor in their right fucking mind going to market to atheists." No. So. No. And if they do, they're cutting in on your action, sir. <laughs> well, that's okay. I, I I don't mind the competition. Matter of fact, uh, one of the reasons I started doing it, uh, and then at some second here, we'll stop talking about me. Um, but the idea was that I want to show other businesses you can make money marketing to this audience, I, I look forward to the day that there's other advisors and insurance people and all kinds of other businesses, accountants, whatever, uh, comedians, you know, that can market to a, a crowd. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, I, I, I think, you know, money is the thing that can get people <laughs> past their bias, either making money or losing money. When you, when you make bias expensive, um, that's also one way of dealing with it, but when you realize it's a market, you know, people tend to get over their, uh, get over themselves, I should say, That's you know, depending on how hardcore they're holding on to, you know, their misinformation. Now, see, I, I thought about for a moment, to just to be fun, I would uh, take a clip of one of your YouTube videos and play it back to you. Oh my gosh. But okay. I thought, what a horrible thing to do to a comedian, so I'm not doing that. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Because I'm like, how would that be received? I, I don't know. That's probably like, oh, ugh, why do you have to do that? Uh, the other thing I had had done just recently is I, I finally read your book in preparation for the interview. Ah. And for those who don't know, you wrote a book. And since my show is rated for language, it's okay if people are confused at the title. But I'll just say it real quick. It's called Dick Jokes. <laughs> and it's D-I-C-T. Yes. Like dictionary, diction, that kind of thing. I love when I do shows that do have to be worried about the FCC. Yes. And the, you know, the enunciation of that T is very important. <laughs> yeah. Me dick -t jokes. Yes, exactly. It becomes completely unnatural um, and hilarious. But again, it, it gets it gets you talking about, you know, what the book actually is. Um which is fun, which is fun. You know, it's, it's, I mean, it was a, a silly concept, but people seem to dig it, you know, and the whole idea, you know, as you know, behind the book, I'd love to know what you thought about it, um, is that words would be more fun if they meant what they sound like. Well, ab absolutely. And, and it was funny, as I was going through the book and, and I had, my wife was driving and I'm sitting here reading the book out loud to her and I'm waiting to see the, the times that she responds because quite frankly... Well, some of the jokes are a little more visual than auditory. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, based on how the word looks. And then mm -hmm. the other words that I didn't know how to pronounce, that, that I was, or it was a word that was so sophisticated that I thought if you have to sit and explain it, it can lose a little bit of humor, especially for a podcast. Right. right. So I went through and I made it, you know, I, I picked a whole bunch that I think would be cute to do on the show, but I wondered if you had any, because I know you're adding con concepts to this, do you have any favorites that you like? Um, I do, actually, I do, and I, I, I completely know what you're saying, you know, the, the auditory experience is different from the visual experience, right? because, you know, I've had people, you know, when I have my book at my shows, you know, they'll, they'll pick it up and they'll flip open, it's just to some random page, and then they start giggling, and it may or may not be a word that works you know, if it's said out loud, because some of them are pretty like, that's a word. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it is. A, it is. I, I like to say I'm, I'm entertaining on a variety of levels for people, no matter how you want to experience. And, and this is not I mean, if you have a very limited vocabulary, you may struggle with this book. 
Well, see, that I think that's also the fun of the book. You know, you don't have to have a good vocabulary.